The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, for the most part, y'all do okay on your exams or any questions uh, about the exam or any other particular questions themselves? How do you want us to format the lesson plan? Do you want us to give you like a full manuscript for the confession? Well, and I'll, I'll throw an outline. And it can all be bullet points. I mentioned that to you before. But how you want to teach it can be bullet points. I what I ate for breakfast this morning. That's my problem, not yours. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I think you've seen the importance of knowing the catechism. If you knew the catechism, you were going to make a decent grade on that exam. Because I also recognize that many of you have not done essay questions maybe ever. Uh, are a long time, or not many. And so it's also kind of a jumping and getting your feet wet, having you write some essay. You're always going to have essay questions, but uh, uh, you get enough extra points for the top part of the exam. That, uh, and I'm a pretty easy grader as well, so I'm much more hoping you get the points. So. Now, the final exam if anybody's interested in doing an oral examination, it would be a week earlier, because I have to leave on Wednesday the 4th, I guess, 5th, uh, for Australia. So the uh, Tuesday the 4th, if anybody wanted to do an oral exam, and enough people want to do an oral exam to make it worthwhile, then I would do that. Otherwise, they would do a written exam the same time exam week Tuesday, 4 30, 7 30. What would be the advantage of uh, the oral exam? Uh, two hours. Shorter. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to have, uh, probably, you're not going to, you know, you'll be asked short answer questions, probably one essay question. Uh, you're able to make So, sure. this oral examination, you're going to spend two hours with each of us? Or am I missing something? You're missing something. <laughs> he said, what would be the advantage? And I said, two hours. Oh. So you'd only be, probably, it would depend on how many there are. They never go the full amount of time. But um, you will have oral examination in Reformed spirituality, but he does it a bit differently than I do. We're trying to get you prepared to think on your feet. Uh, and so, in the future, you will have in, with me oral examination. You don't have to do it this time. And I don't require people who English is a second language for oral exam if they don't want to. So you don't ever have to do an oral exam. Do you recommend doing oral if someone would do it either way? Do you recommend it? I do for advanced uh, students. I don't know at this point. I'm trying to remember what I did last year. Uh, I, did I give an oral exam last year in this class? I don't think in this class. You did in class this elevation. Okay, all right. So, it's probably not the best thing at this point because of the comprehensive nature. I and mean, it's a lot of material. So I probably couldn't assess you as easily. <clears throat> now, Eli wants to take the written exam early, which I'd be glad anybody wants to take it early. You're on the road, it's fine as well. So I want you to spin it short. Hey, Dr. Piper. Yes, sir. If we take an oral exam and we bomb it, will we be able to take the final exam? <laughs> no, sir, I'm sorry. <coughs> Dr. Piper. Mr. Dodson. I am, I'm willing to take an oral exam, but uh, in the words of my presbytery, you may have to extend time due to the candidate's extreme verbiosity. I know that. <laughs> I thought you were pretty channeled on your written exam. But I think I wrote a note to that effect, did I not? I don't. I think I wrote twice S U C C I N C T. Twice on your exam I wrote that, right? As in, as in, I was the saint, and you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
No, I think the word N-E-E-D was also with it. <laughs> or M-O-R-E. I hope I hit your vocabulary okay. <laughs> If you're spelling things on the fly, I, I'm just going to have to look at the example. <laughs> you haven't looked at it yet? Obviously. Well, Dr. Popeye didn't. I went through and I tallied up the points, and I thought, well, I did okay. And then I was happy with myself. Well, you did okay, but you could be more succinct. That's all. I'm trying to groom you for the future, my friend. I will try to be more succinct. Say it. Succinct. Any other questions about the exam? We'll, we'll just do a written final. I was just trying to help myself not have to grade 28. Final so you were pretty much the same uh, format as the midterm exam. Sir? It would be uh, pretty much the same as the midterm exam. It's going to be the same format. Uh, some short answer questions with extra points. Now, who was it that decided to answer every question on the essay session? I thought you. I think paying enough attention, I didn't have to do that. I should have graded off for not paying attention. I had, to, <laughs> I had to read six answers. You did it too? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no you didn't. Only, only Jonathan did. No, I didn't do that. I knew who did it. Yeah, this important thing to learn to follow directions. Because I've had people not follow directions to get through the first <coughs> three out of six and not answer, or maybe then two and, and hardly answer the last two. And that doesn't help your grade. Very good. You, you gave good answers, so. Now, you can learn succinctness from Jonathan if you're interested. We could talk Zach. That's dangerous. But I appreciate that very much. I do need to learn. And Jonathan's already turned his paper in, too, guys. So if anybody wants to see a model of a paper, just ask him to show you his. I'll send you an email to see. <laughs> One more housekeeping. Uh, does anybody uh, have a wife, uh, Ethan, or whatever, that, Jonathan, that wants to go to the thing tonight? Do you need to get home? Are you going to meet them here or what? Show, show them. You need to get the baby at? Uh, we'll, we'll do a little transfer. All right, so that means that's you all out of here at 7? Is that the idea? Okay. Do you need to get home before 7? <coughs> Does anybody need to get home before 7 so wife can get here? In other words, go and take up the children. My wife will not come. She'll not come. Because we all have one car. I'm saying I'm going to send you home early. How far do you live? My wife can probably pick the wife up. Oh, if she wants to go. Oh, I didn't even know that I do, so. But she did. She did. <laughs> <laughs> you can call her at the break. Anyway, I'll let you go early if she wants to come and need a car, or I need you to watch the kids. I just don't want this class to compete with that. Ethan needs to go find a wife, so he'll spend his time. <laughs> <laughs> he, he and Fabio can team up and. I think I, I, I think Jonathan's about got the, the problem answered, so he's in a different class now. So. And there's Martin. <laughs> quiet. A quiet one. They're the most dangerous, aren't they? Okay, so we got a lot of people sick. Uh, Hannah's sick. Justin's sick, but tell me he would be online. Nope. He's not yet. Okay. Uh, Exodus 20, then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, Jehovah your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, 
but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, Jehovah your God in vain, for the Jehovah will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Jehovah your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let's pray. We bless your name, Jehovah God, for you are our God, and we are your people. We thank you for your covenant purchased and sealed to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your law. We you reveal your holy nature and how you would have us to walk in obedience to you. We thank you for the privilege this evening to study together. Lord, we ask that now your spirit would be at work in us, that you would be praised and hallowed in our class thinking instruction, that your kingdom would come in our lives and through us throughout the world, that your will be done in our lives. Provide for us, Lord, tiredness and with colds. We pray you uphold all those who are sick now in our community as well as those more seriously, in, uh, more serious sicknesses such as Jude or Ellie. And Lord, we ask that you will forgive us of our sins as we seek you and that you will indeed put sin to death in our lives. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. All right, I have wrestled with how to put this material together and I've thought about trying to develop uh, the chapter on worship and the Sabbath as we work our way through a summary of the law but I might just save those catechisms for next week so I still don't know but we'll get going and Consider the law of God. Again, then, with uh, paragraph one deals with the law before the fall. God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling and threatened death upon the breach of it and endued him with power and ability to keep it. So, so who do we have up here besides Mr. Dotson? Oh, Mr. Tom. Mr. Tom, uh, what did God give to Adam before the fall? Come on, mute. Um, Righteousness, the ability, capability to obey God. The answer to any question I've asked you tonight is going to come out of the words that we just read. No, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that. That's, I'm, not, I'm not going to ask you to other things. I just it's time to start trying to get you talking. So, what did God give to Adam? What's the very first thing that God gave to Adam, Mr. Tom? No, Mr. Dodson. Covenant of works. No. Very first thing, Mr. Early. A law. A law. 
He gave to Adam a law. Now, that law is involved in the covenant of works. But you remember when we talked about the covenant of works, the law is, is uh, the covenant of works is more than the not eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We said that it was given, that pro, prohibition, probation was given in a context, a moral context. And what is not spelled out here, but if you look at larger catechism 91, what is the duty which God requires of man? The duty which God requires of man is obedience to his revealed will. And then, first half of 92, the rule of obedience revealed to Adam in the state of innocence and to all mankind in him, besides a special command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was the moral law. So it was a standard of obedience that was given to Adam in the garden. And it's very important to note here, we talked about this when we did the covenant, that uh, Adam by creation was under the moral law and under God's justice. And so he was required to obey the law. If he disobeyed it, he would have been destroyed. Anybody else born would have been destroyed. And would have lived under perpetual uh, obligation to obey God perfectly. The covenant is brought in to provide a means by which God can justify and confirm in righteousness all those for whom Adam acted. So the law is bigger, given to Adam, apart from the covenant, but the covenant would have included the responsibility to keep the moral law. I was just curious, Dr. Pipe, in terms of the revealing of the, the moral law, is it understood as being something that it's revealed in the sense that God created Adam with this knowledge of the law, or is it more of like a assumed you know, Mount Sinai type situation and giving of a law? All right, good question. Um, we don't know with respect to all of God's commandments. Adam being in the image of God, we know from Romans then, would have had the law in his heart perfect. So he would have known the moral will of God perfectly. Whatever uh, revelation God added, we do know that God added three commandments to that. What were they? Well, that's a, not a moral law. The fourth, the fourth, and the eighth, and the sixth. Work in the garden. Sabbath, which would include work, but then uh, the eighth commandment also uh, includes work. Hi, Lucas. And then uh, the uh, seventh commandment in the marriage ordinance. So we know that he had that much. But whatever was written on his heart, he would have known it perfectly. Because he had perfect knowledge. And so he has the law. God then, in the context of the law, makes this covenant of works, which we've already studied, by which he bound him and all his posterity. And what's interesting here is because all posterity was bound to moral perfection, that didn't change with the covenant of works. What the covenant of works meant was that all posterity would have been confirmed and able. So the standard would not have changed. If Adam had not sinned, all of us would have been born perfect under then the ability and responsibility to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience. You need to understand this, that that doesn't change. Uh, we would have had that in Adam. That would have been part of our eternal life. And so because that is a responsibility uh, in creation as well as in the covenant of works, that responsibility then um, continues. So Larger Catechism 93, the moral law is a declaration of the will of God to mankind, directing and binding everyone <coughs> to personal, perfect, and perpetual conformity and obedience. So that parallels personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience. Thereunto, in the frame and disposition of the whole man, soul, and body, 
and in performance of those duties of holiness and righteousness which he owed to God and man, promising life upon the fulfilling and threatening death upon the breach of it. So all people made in the image of God are under this responsibility. God, through the covenant of works, gave a way that all could be confirmed in that the violation of the covenant of works in no way annuls the responsibility for what we have here, personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience. What does personal mean? You must either do it yourself or in your covenant head, but then you'll do it yourself as you're in the covenant head. Entire, we're in the larger catechism, soul and body, exact, uh, dispositions, what does it say? Um, the frame and disposition of the whole man, soul and body, exact, so that will be the um, perfect um, obedience that we are called uh, to uh, do in the larger catechism. And perpetual means that we'll never cease. You know, it never ceases for us as well. And that lays the foundation for where we're going. Yes, sir. Dr. Pipe, you mentioned the relationship between personal and then like the aspect of federal headship. Could you flesh that a little bit? Well, I'm just saying is that even if we had been confirmed in Adam, we still would have a responsibility personally to obey. So he, he obeyed personally for us, but that would not have absolved us from personal obedience. It's just we could not have disobeyed. But what I'm, I'm, I'm laying the foundation so you can understand these four things, personal, entire, exact, perpetual, or add perfect to that. Has that standard changed? No. That's where we want to go. So in the covenant of works, what did God offer to the keeper? Uh, ben? What did God offer in the covenant of works as a promise? Promised life. Just remember the language is out of the paragraph. Promised life upon the fulfilling. And Mr. Early, what did God threaten? He threatened death upon the breach. And with that, he gave Adam the power to obey. So he had promises uh, and ability as well. So given to Adam, binding upon all. And the moral law then is the summary of God's revealed will. And by moral law, it is, as I've said to you before, a reflection of who God is and our relationship to Him and one another. These are absolute standards of righteousness that may never change. That's different from what kind of law? Positive law. When we talked about the covenant, that's simply something's right or wrong because God for a period of time commanded people to do it or forbid them to do it. But it's not, it doesn't have a moral relationship to him or to other people. Now paragraph two gets into the law after the fall. This law, after his fall, continues to be a perfect rule of righteousness. As such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in 10 commandments and written in two tables the first four commandments containing our duty towards God and the other six, our duty to men. The larger catechism adds that they were uh, delivered by the voice of God upon Mount Sinai and written by God on two tablets of stone and recorded in the 20th chapter of Exodus. And the first four vert commandments deal with our duty to God and the other six, our duty uh, to uh, man. So, has the standard changed? No, the fall didn't affect the standard. And so it's still a perfect rule of righteousness. So what is happening at Mount Sinai? Was this an act of judgment or grace? Grace. Hmm? Sin boldly. Well, he already revealed the moral law. He said, sin boldly. 
Is it grace or? Grace. Grace, that's it. <laughs> Ryan, your head was kind of moving like yeah. a, one of these dolls. It, it is. It is grace. <laughs> it's grace. Okay. Very important you understand this. I wish our evangelical friends understood it. It was a wonderful thing that God did. Because of the fall, the law written on man's heart was now defaced. But man was still responsible to obey God according to the moral law, right? So at Mount Sinai, for his covenant people, in special revelation, he gives them now a hard copy. Spoken by him and written by his finger to show its perpetual nature. And thus, it is the summary of God's moral revelation. Now, uh, Jonathan. Do you think that all of the commandments were each duplicated on each tablet? That's where I'm going right now. Okay. Thank you. How would you respond to John Owen's arguments against that? Against what? Against the law being a covenant of grace versus covenant of works reaction. <coughs> I don't want to get into that tonight. Sure. That's <laughs> one of the few places I disagree with John Owen. I think he was way off the reservation. Uh, give it to you and Mr. Dotson to ask all the advanced questions. So it's going to be good to have you all in Covenant Theology. I was a 1689 Federalist. That's why. I have a question on that same topic. But I'm not going to answer it. Anyway. <laughs> Go ahead, Zach. I, I'm just wondering, obviously he asked about John Owen. Others like Thomas Boston and someone have indicated that it, it was a republication of the Covenant Works I'm wondering, is it hetero-orthodox or in some way negative to acknowledge that in the covenant of, uh, the, co the law given at Mount Sinai, there's elements of the covenant of works in the sense that do this and ye shall live type yeah, of thing? I think that's repeated. I, I agree with Turretin and many of the Puritans to that effect, that it was reiterated. It's a covenant of grace. So it's reiterated to show you first you can't do it. Second, it's reiterated uh, as the law's purpose then to drive men to Christ. And third, it's reiterated because Christ did do it. And I think Christ fulfilled the covenant curse and obedience through the Mosaic economy. So that's a little preview for two years down the road. First semester of your third year gives you a reason to stay in there and stay the course. Now, Jonathan asked a very good question. The, catech the ca confession says that they were on two tables. The first table was the first four, and the second was the sixth. So the duty toward God, the duty toward man. That is the traditional um, interpretation of the two stone tablets. Meredith Klein, as he studied the uh, Hittite treaties, and discovered that uh, when these treaties were imposed, there were usually two uh, copies. Um, somebody needs to mute their, um, there we go, thank you. Welcome, brother. We're glad you joined thank us. Thank you. All right, I was wondering what had happened to you. Work will in a meeting. Work will get us, won't it? Um, so that th they were actually, uh, as was duplicate, copy. Now that he has gotten out of uh, extra biblical research. <clears throat> I'm not sure it makes a bit of difference. Uh, I think that uh, I don't build anything conclusively on extra biblical research. I don't develop the covenant out of extra biblical research. So uh, I don't think I can be conclusive about it. So I'm very comfortable with the language of the confession that it's uh, kind of what you see pictured, the two tablets, one with the four, one with the six. I'm not uncomfortable with the other. I guess that if you men in your presbytery, if you were questioned about exceptions, you might need to say, well, I, I scruple this language. I really think it was, the commandments were written twice. Uh, but that would be the only thing. I don't, there's no theological. Difference. I answer your question. Good. All right. Next, the types of law. 
So paragraph three, besides this law, and that's the moral law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age. This is language of Galatians. Church and its minority under age would have uh, schoolmaster tutors. A tutor, as Paul deals with that language in Galatians, was not the tutor as we speak of a tutor, but was simply the slave that actually led the children to school and came to school and picked them up and led them home, which you see then the, the nice parallel, and I'll deal with this in the sermon tomorrow in chapel, with the law. So, underage church, ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly holding forth divers' instructions of moral duties, all which ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the New Testament. So what's the two, uh, Ethan, the two types of, of ceremonial law? It's in the language of the paragraph. How many times do I have to say this? <laughs> I'm looking. We're having it in a car. Uh, worship, preaching Christ, his race actions, suffering benefits, All right. and diverse. So the, the, the first role then is to be typical of Christ in the fullness of his work. Uh, work. Uh, interesting, um, partly of worship prefiguring Christ, his graces, and actions, and his benefits. So this would be the entire priestly sacrificial system and all of the temple ordinances. Now, uh, one of the things that I derive here is that uh, in the New Testament, I think the congregation is the choir because of the priesthood of believers. And there's no place in New Testament worship uh, for a choir apart from the... Uh, congregation. Now that is not a hill to die on, and, and I, my, uh, I've been a member of two churches, uh, my wife is in two churches that have been able to have choirs. I don't make a big deal out of it. When I started a church, we didn't have a choir. <laughs> I helped start a community, we didn't have a choir. So I do think it's a reformational principle that works out of this. But what I will tell you guys in worship is, you know, don't go to a church where in conscience you can't live what they're doing, and if you can live with the choir, then don't, that, don't make that the issue. So, everybody understand, I'm not making it an issue. My wife's a member of a church that has a choir. <coughs> All right, but you, I want you now to start thinking about these things. Uh, now you've got four years to percolate, search the scriptures, um, and uh, Lord willing, make reach some biblical decisions. And there really weren't any choirs in Reformed Presbyterian churches before <coughs> the second part of the 19th century. So there's also the historical value <coughs> to consider. All right, that's the first type, though. Um, and what's the second type of ceremonial law? Instruction of moral duties. All right, so there's a instruction in moral duties. What would be some of the ceremonial, what are some of the moral duties that come out of the ceremonial law? Not to muzzle the ox. All right, not to muzzle the ox, so that a laborer is worthy as hire. Jonathan? I've heard some use ceremonial laws to base morning and evening worship to that it's important to that's one of the arguments, yes. And that uh, that's also parallel Psalm 92. Uh, in the morning declare God's loving kindness and in the evening declare his faithfulness. Uh, how about the food laws? What moral principle are the food laws teaching? The holiness abstaining from wickedness, I guess. All right, more generally, but uh, so any of the laws of cleanliness and uncleanness were teaching God's people to abstain from any form of that which was unclean. And because they were children, uh, spiritually, the unclean was done much more externally 
than it is, this is with your children uh, when they're three and four and when they're 16. You've got different, uh, it's different standards there. Uh, the God's the Lord of all of life, so God's the Lord of what we eat. So we're to eat to his glory. And whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, whatever, we do it to, uh, to the glory of God. Uh, the not plowing with the two different types of animals, how does Paul apply that one? They're not being equally yoked. And where do you think that language comes from? Well, it's an ox and a mule yoked together, which wouldn't have been very fair to the mule anyway. But, uh, <laughs> um, so there's more principles that are there, but then notice the principles remain, but no ceremonial law remains uh, in the church. All right, what's the other type of law? Is judicial, paragraph four. To them also as a body politic, he gave them sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. So this would have to do with, um, say, in Exodus 21 to 23 laws, you, uh, <coughs> laws governing the violation of the commandments and the sanctions that would be attached to those violations. <coughs> Uh, so that uh, if a woman <coughs> struck a man in the wrong place, what was done to her? Her hand was cut off. Right? That is a judicial law. That was to, it's not just because of chastity, that's because of the whole road of, of the seed uh, in, in the Old Covenant people. Um, so laws regulating the, the uh, punishment uh, with respect to unchastity, whether it's forcible rape or whether a woman's in the city and she doesn't cry out, uh, that was not considered rape. Um, so you've got, you've got these types of laws as well. And then you've got things like um, a parapet. Uh, what's a parapet? A wall around the roof because the roof was the patio. And in the Mediterranean climate, that's where you would hang out in the evenings. And so the principle of what? What's the principle there? Protection. Protection of life on your property. So if you have a swimming pool, the state shouldn't need to tell you to put a fence around it. God's word tells you. So the principle <coughs> of equity is the moral <coughs> principle that is found in the uh, judicial law. And I really wish we would do more today in ethics of looking for the moral principles because what's happened here is that through the theonomy of Christian ethics and reconstruction, what we have then is uh, trying to apply these laws in much more wholesale fashion with their sanctions. So, um, for example, to cut the woman's head off, put the belligerent child to death, put the adulterer, the homosexual to death, put the rapist to death. Um, <clears throat> so it's two things to keep in mind. We must look for the principle of equity in the first place. <clears throat> and any of these laws <clears throat> that would deal with moral conduct would be laws to be enforced by the church and church discipline. And the more serious uh, sanctions obviously should be excommunication. Uh, and so the church now, which is not in any way part of the state, has a responsibility spiritually to look for the principles and apply them, both in terms of law and in terms of sanctions. So for example, if I have a, a man in my church and uh, a, a young man uh, seduces his daughter, I would go to the judicial law and look for the principles. And that is that the father has the right to require him to marry her. 
the father has a right to say, no, you may not marry her, but you're going to pay a fine, which means you're going to support, if, if there's a baby involved, you're going to support the baby. Otherwise, there would not be any pecuniary cash type things. But these are principles that come out of that relationship. There's also the principle that the father does have a say-so in whom his daughter marries. And that's seen further in Numbers 30, when, again, you could say that judicial law that the if a woman takes an oath in her father's house and he thinks it's improper, he may annul that oath and she's not guilty. Or if she takes it in the father's house and she goes into her marriage and her husband learns of that oath, he may annul it. What you see there is a transfer of headship. That God has definitely placed women under the headship of fathers and husbands when they are in uh, a young state, a marriageable state. Now, a divorced woman, Puritans dealt with this, had no need to return to a father's household or headship, but single women, even if they lived apart, so say a lady goes to university, she still has responsibility to be in submission to her father, and a wise father would deal with a session in the town where she was at university and uh, ask them to take a careful oversight of her while she's there. So those are principles of equity that I think are found uh, in, uh, in these laws, or reparations. Think how much better off our culture would be if we weren't putting uh, drug dealers and robbers in prison and making them pay restitution, working and paying restitution. We wouldn't have the tax burden. It's what, 70,000 a year or something to keep one person incarcerated. And then the victims would actually get some advantage uh, out of this person having to work and to... Uh, so now the fine goes to the state if there's a fine. Rarely does the fine ever go to to the victim. So that would be a, 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 a principle. In fact, even um, I can remember reading in Time Magazine back, oh, in the 70s, that the, uh, one of the islands off of Britain, I think it was Guernsey, still had um, flogging as a form of punishment. And the UN court made them stop. Mm -hmm. Actually, it'd be a very good form of punishment. You get flogged in a merciful way. I mean, the Bible lays it out. 40 strokes less one, something like that. Um, I, I think that you probably would have a much lower, what do you call it, recidivate, recidivate rate. Folks wouldn't keep misbehaving. You get flogged <laughs> and you pay reparations. And just think about it. So this is all the wisdom of God that's in his law. So we're not, we're not the state. And I think that's where theonomists go wrong, although a great number of my friends would hold to these positions. And a number of churches that support the seminary probably hold to uh, these uh, positions. And with respect to the sanctions, Calvin says something very interesting in the very last chapter of the Institute. I think that's where it is, in the Civil Magistrate. It says, when uh, the natural law punishment and the biblical punishment less, the state should do it. So since it's a, a natural law punishment that adulterous, adulterers or adulterers are put to death and in the Bible that's the case, Calvin had no problem. He didn't say it was required, but had no problem putting... Now we're not talking about somebody that sins and repents. We're talking now about the um, hardened person. And I think that would be true for sexual immorality, obviously for rape, kidnapping, homosexuality, um, that uh, these sins that had a death penalty attached to them in the broader uh, non-biblical culture is something that magistrates should think seriously about uh, reinstituting. How would you identify something such as the death penalty for adultery as a law of nations or a natural law? It's quite Could, couldn't nations be wrong? Possibly. No, it's when they coalesce with the biblical law, not because they had it. No, his whole thing was, it's when they were doing that which God required in the biblical law. That's when it could be a wise, not required, but a wise thing to do it. Most nations put adulterers to death. Everybody put murderers to death. But that also is above the, the theocratic laws of Israel um, as well. So I'm not saying do that. I'm just saying that with Calvin, I think there's a, a proper principle there. Um, and, I mean, I, I, well, I won't go there. 
Other thing here is uh, the role of the moral law in our criminal code. Now, the moral law played a much more important role in the criminal code of the West uh, than it does now. And it makes much more sense than a civil compact. Um, murder's not wrong because 75% of us think it's wrong. Murder's wrong because God's word says it is wrong. And it's pretty easy for people on the second table of the law to see that outside the last one, which gets into thoughts, and civil codes never, this idea of hate crimes, the role of civil law is not to judge motives. It's only to deal with actions, which means words or conduct. Um, but the first four are where we get into then um, heartburn. Um, this is a universal moral standards for all people. So if we had a Christian society, what would be the role of the first four laws in our criminal code? Local sheriffs would be enforcing them. <laughs> we got to make them laws first. And my somewhat compromise on that is I would think that all four should be enforced with respect to if we had uh, Muslims living in our society, they would be allowed in private to worship according to their conscience, but they'd not be allowed to do any public propagation or gathering for that. Uh, that's probably not as strong as some people would want, but that's trying to live realistically in the world where we are. I do think we have in Nehemiah and Ezra some patterns that would teach the church how to live under a, uh, a non-Christian government. And again, these are books that should be considered. So the Sabbath was being enforced uh, in the Christian community uh, by, uh, by Nehemiah. It's also interesting, a lot of folks think that ministers shouldn't get tax breaks, but, but uh, Cyrus did give uh, tax breaks to the priest. Uh, and so there's principles there that we also could work uh, more on. The other problem with theonomy reconstruction is those that think that uh, everything's going to collapse and it's by the law that we're going to build a new culture. No, it's only the gospel that changes people. If culture collapsed today, we would not, we could not rush in and establish biblical laws, but we would take advantage of preaching law and gospel and look for conversions. And then if God, in fact, bless us with conversions, then we can wrestle with these problems, what to do with, with these laws in the Bible. Dr. Piper. Yes, sir. I, you can slap me if you do I not I can't like reach you. <laughs> I got witnesses. When he's here, I get to slap him, right? Okay. All right, go ahead. So my, my question is, with this idea of general equity and what you're saying, two questions, and I'll try to be succinct. One, how is it not the inescapable uh, reality, as it were, that the magistrate has an obligation to enforce both tables of the law? And then two, why did um, the American revision not clarify general equity for the magistrate? Uh, as to the first, I think the magistrate may enforce the moral law. If I were the governor of uh, South Carolina and I had a Christian legislature, I would outlaw abortion and same-sex marriage. So, uh, as to the second, I don't think the original defines general equity, does it? I mean, that's... It does not define general equity, no, sir, but um, I, I think that when you read it in light of the original chapter on the, on the ch church and the original chapter on the state, you kind of get a, a, an establishmentarian magistrate is enforcing both tables of God's law picture. Yes, if you're an Erastian, you surely would. That's your slap. <laughs> An Erastian was a member of parliament. It was the majority of parliament, which is why this came through as it did. They believed that the state had ultimate authority 
uh, to enforce uh, biblical laws and church discipline. So I'm not sure you can so with such uh, ease separate the establishmentarian principle from irrationalism, A. B, that's all they knew. I mean, every European state was governed by a, quote, Christian magistrate, whether he was a Romanist or a Lutheran or a Reformed. So, but we'll have to save that for a, a, a nice uh, convivial circle of uh, cigars, pipes, and adult beverages, okay? I, I appreciate that, sir. So you'll have to make sure you get down here to visit. I will be there in December, hopefully by way of Selma, Alabama. By way of Selma, Alabama. That's a fish hook. You going fishing? <coughs> oh. No, sir. I'm in January. I'm trying to go preach in our church in Selma. Oh, okay. Exhorting. <laughs> All right. So I don't. I mean, uh, I didn't want to cover some of this and try to be fair about it. Um, I'm not at all unsympathetic to many of the uh, requests or desires of those that we call theonomists. Uh, my other problem is you've got uh, two schools. You've got those that are like me. There's the means of grace guys. They hold to a theonomy of Christian ethics, but they recognize the church's role is to be uh, evangelism and discipleship. And these are the people that are, we're closest to, these people that support the, the seminary. But these that are off into, they're going, everything's going to come by law, uh, and you're preaching to the state that's not there on the Lord's Day of how, what should be enforced in the courts and stuff like that is, I think, quite useless, A, B, it really denies the spirituality of the church, which is a doctrine we'll come to later. So, the moral law doth forever bind all as well justified persons as others. So, right off the bat, now, what are we being told here, Fabio? You guys are daydreaming back there. I'm getting to this. Huh? Because you were, you were in Brazil thinking about it, weren't you? Uh, <laughs> no, I asked you. The moral law doth forever bind all. What's the principle that's being established there? You're a lawyer. This should be an easy thing for you, right? It's like, uh, the headship, like, uh, federation. When, what, is the, what do the words mean? That's all I'm asking you. Oh. The moral law doth forever bind all. You want to know what this means? <laughs> <laughs> so, I do. Means that everybody needs to bite the wall. That's it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Who's everybody? <coughs> Both the Christian and non-Christian are responsible to obey. You're not fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a lawyer. The emphasis here is that every individual image bearer of God is under the moral law, bound to obey it, bound to suffer the penalty. <coughs> of disobeying. So it's a very important principle. As well, justified persons as others. And so contrary to modern evangelicalism, the justified also are bound by the moral law to obey. And that not only in regard of the matter contained in it, but also in respect of the authority of God the Creator who gave it. So what are the, the two reasons that all are to keep the, uh, uh, the moral law? 
Um, Caleb? Uh, the matter contained in it and the All right, so the, ma the wisdom of it is, is Moses was in Deuteronomy 4. No nation had laws so wise. And so the, the, the wisdom of the laws itself, the equity and glory, and then... The authority of God who gave it. The authority of God. Notice it's God. Um, the creator. So again, remind us, it's not God the redeemer. It's God the creator to whom all are obligated. And then so we'll be very clear, neither does Christ in the gospel anyway dissolve, but much strengthens this obligation. So the gospel doesn't say, don't worry about the law. The gospel came to show the beauty of the law because Christ fulfilled it and then gives us grace to live by it, but never to weaken it. Now, the, uh, in this language, we get the use, what's called the use of the law. Did anybody in the reading of Calvin get his three uses of the law? Mark? I've read that, sir. I just asked Mark, though, but thank you. I'll come to you if nobody mm -hmm. else. Uh, the there first, uh, my memory is that the first one is uh, to restrain non-believers' uh, conscience point us to Christ and show our weakness, our inability to keep alone. The third one is to teach us how to live um, um, with thankfulness. Okay. You gave the order of the confession. Calvin's order is the more traditional order. Uh, lead us to Christ, restrain sin, and give the believer a rule of life. There, there are three there, that, yeah, they're the same three. But here, uh, the, the the first use, Calvin's first use, is implied in uh, Larger Catechism 95. The moral law is of use to all men to inform them of the holy nature and will of God, binding them to walk accordingly. So here we just simply see this is the, the, the fabric, the glue uh, for uh, society. And so, uh, that's the, the first use according to the standards, which would be the second use in Calvin. The second use in both, then, is the use to bring people to faith in Christ. Um, 94, although no man since the fall can attain to righteousness and life by the moral law, yet there is great use thereof as well common to all men, peculiar either to the, uh, that's just kind of a summary, it's still used to all men. But uh, 96, what particular use is there of the moral law to the unregenerate? Now this is the particular use, between the general use. The moral laws of use to unregenerate men to awaken their consciences, to flee from wrath to come, and drive them to Christ. Or upon their continuance in the estate and way of sin, to leave them inexcusable and under the curse thereof. So that would be the third use of the law. This is greatly absent in most modern preaching and evangelism. It gets back to the question, was the, um, uh, hello Joshua, you made it too. I'm so glad. Are y'all, you had a church responsibility? I haven't been feeling well all day, sir. Okay, that's going around. I, I've been here the whole time. My camera was not. Oh, all right. Very good. Uh, used to have a little chart up there that told me who was here. So I'm going to do this in chapel tomorrow, this use of the law which is to shut men up to their sin, to leave them without excuse. But you remember, if you're, if you're witnessing to someone, what must I do to be saved? What do you say? What it must it be to be right with God? Put it that way. How do I get eternal life? Answering with what Christ said. You to the rich man. young ruler. 
keep the law. It's powerful. You tell all these Bible built people around you, if you want to go to heaven, you must obey the law of God perfectly. That's what the Bible says. <coughs> Nobody can do that. Ah, that's right. One did it, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're obligated to do so. And if you don't do so, you're going to hell. Well, that's not fair. God's perfectly just. God has made you, and God's obligated you to obey Him perfectly. And you do that. You love God with your heart, mind, soul, strength. Nobody can do that. You press and press and press. You press the conscience until there's some conviction of sin. And then you bring them to uh, what God has done for sinners. We're rushing into what God's done for sinners, and we're testimony to get a church that's full of unconverted people. They think they're converted but they've had no uh, realization of what God has saved them from. And, and, um, so it's very important that we understand this third use of the law and that we uh, use it in our preaching and our evangelism. Any questions about that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, with regard to that use of the law, you gave the example of evangelism and how our failure to do that has led to churches full of unconverted people. Is there an appropriateness to continuing that use even for multiple sermons oh, yeah. at the time without yeah. actually giving that you know, second half? Yeah, I mean, no, it's never preaching. I'm always going to go to Christ, but I'm going to probably I'm going to preach the law, the necessity of repentance, and the obligation of people to... So in a single sermon, you would always do that? I always go to Christ. Yeah. Now, 6 and 7, give the law and the believer... If, if I'm if I ask you to tell me the third use the three uses of the law, got, got that one down. And if I were to ask you to use the uh, confessions or catechism's first use of the law and evangelism as an essay question, you understand now what I'm after. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of work. So, again, this language, you're under grace and not under law. We're talking about for acceptance with God. Paul doesn't mean that the, uh, he's only dealing with justification in those types of remarks. To be thereby justified or condemned, yet it's of great use to them as well as to others in that as a rule of life, informing them of the will of God and their duty. And, and if I were you, I'd take a pencil I right, write it in my notes and get these enumerated. That's one. So rule of life, forming them of the will of God and their duty, directs and binds them to walk accordingly. Two, discovering also the sinful pollutions of their nature, hearts, and lives. Three, so as examining themselves thereby, they may come to further conviction of humiliation for and hatred against sin together with a clear sight of the need they have of Christ and of the perfection of his obedience. Or you could take all of that as three. Next, it is likewise of use to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions and that it forbids sin. And the threatenings of it serve to show what even their sins deserve and what afflictions in this life they may expect from them, although freed from the curse thereof threatened in the law. Next, the promises of it in like manner show them God's approbation of obedience and what blessings they may expect upon the performance thereof, although not as due to them by the law as a covenant of works, so as man's doing good and refraining from evil, because the law encourages the one and deterreth the other, is no evidence of being under the law and not under grace. So these are very important uses of, of the law in our lives, informing the will of God and of duty, directing, binding to walk, showing the corruption of our nature becomes the basis of self-examination. So the, the, the law is a very good place to examine yourself regularly and also in particular times for the Lord's Supper. Brings conviction and hatred of sin. Shows you need of Christ and his obedience. And then restrains corruption 
by forbidding sin and threatening punishment and by promises of blessing. Now, should either one of those motives have a role in Christian, a Christian's obedience? How, Jonathan? They should play a role in our obedience because God has given us promises of blessing and threats and he would not do that purposelessly. Okay. So it's not the highest motivation. So none of us are every day, 24 hours a day, <coughs> functioning at that level. Aren't we? So we sometimes function at a fairly low motivational level. And so um, if I commit this sin, I know that I'm going to have problems because God knows what I'm doing. I live my life before Him and I don't want God's displeasure. Or uh, God says, test me and tithe and I will bless you. Um, believe it. Uh, but the, the good summary is in Paul in Ephesians 6 verse 2 when he quotes the promise of the fifth commandment he nuances it now to the church and not the people in the land that you shall have long life and prosperity to the degree because for God's glory and your good but covenant obedience brings a better life it brings a greater degree uh, Christian stewardship, Christian care of property, all these things have side benefits. Um, and a, a Christian health style is normally you're going to live longer because God blesses it. That's how he's designed us. So you read Proverbs. The, the promises in Proverbs are not prescriptive, but they are general directives. And we recognize that God will deal with each of us in the way that's best for us. But there's a pattern there. And God says it's perfectly fine uh, to keep those things in mind. And of course, Jesus then in the Sermon on the Mount starts with a series of Beatitudes, which are blessings to covenant characteristics. And uh, I would encourage you, Martin Lloyd-Jones, right early in those sermons, has a sermon on God's rewards. It's very useful. It's all by grace. You understand that? Rewards now, rewards in heaven. It's all by grace. But God does these things. Now, obviously, I should obey because I love God. I should take out the trash because I love my wife. But sometimes I take out the trash I know if I don't. <laughs> keep filling the blank. Uh, is the second obedience? Yeah, is it the best? Is it love, sacrificial? Is it the best? No, it's not the best. But I guarantee it's better than not, not just because of, of har disharmony in the marriage, but because I know I'm supposed to serve my wife. And it's the same way with God, just on a much higher plane. I know I'm supposed to serve God. Um, and some days, tug of temptation is strong. And uh, it could easily be the threats that would keep you from turning on the computer when uh, the temptation has become almost overwhelming. You with me? Okay. And then, once again, just so there's no confusion, perfect harmony with grace. Neither are the aforementioned uses of the law contrary to the grace of the gospel, but sweetly comply with it. The spirit of Christ subduing and enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully, which the will of God revealed in the law requireth to be done. Isn't that beautiful? That's the hope that belongs to us in Christ. All right. So we're told in uh, 98 larger catechism, the moral law is comprehended in the Ten Commandments, and we've got that repetition of what we've already read there. And the shorter catechism simply says that moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. And uh, we know it's summarized from the Old Testament, love God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor 
as yourself. That's not replacing commandments. That shows us the motivation of commandments and the principles to be operative in the commandments. Now, very important, and I guarantee you that you're going to face this sometime in the next uh, few weeks. What rules are to be the observed for the right understanding of the Ten Commandments? You need to know these eight rules, not verbatim, but the principles. So the first is that the law is perfect and binds everyone to full conformity in the whole man under the righteousness thereof and unto entire obedience forever so as to require the utmost perfection of every duty and forbid the least degree of every sin. That takes us back to where we started and that is that uh, God requires personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience. That's the perfect obedience. And so the law is perfect and binds us to perfect obedience. That's the summary. If you could write that the law is perfect and binds us to perfect obedience. To the law spiritual. And so reacheth the understanding, will, affections, and all of the powers of the soul, as well as words, works, and gestures. So the law is spiritual. Christ illustrates that in the Sermon on the Mount. How? Two different commandments. No, in the Sermon on the Mount. If you hate your brother in your heart, you committed murder, and if you lust for a woman, you committed adultery. So you see how he's moving right to the heart and teaching us the spirituality of the law. So the law is perfect. It binds all to perfection. The law is spiritual and thus searches and is with the heart. Three, the one and same thing in divers, that means different respects, is required are forbidden in several commandments. The commandments overlap. In fact, I believe, and I've done this exercise often, take any sin and look at that sin under all ten commandments, and I believe you will find the principles. But it's surely true. Um, the tenth commandment is idolatry. And so the first commandment, the tenth commandment, you break one, you're breaking the other. The tenth commandment deals with the seventh commandment and the eighth commandment. And the reputation of your brother, the ninth commandment. It easily deals with the fifth commandment because it has to do with your responsibility to show respect uh, to others who are over you and not to be envious of their estate. Uh, that's just, that's just a, a simple example. Uh, you, you, you're never just going to break one commandment. And so you need to be aware of that, that there's an overlapping prohibition in the commandments. And then four, which is very important, and I call this the, uh, uh, the principle of opposites, that as where a duty is commanded, the contrary sin is forbidden. And where the sin is forbidden, the contrary duty is commanded. So where a promise is annexed, that means added to, the contrary threatening is included. And where a threatening is annexed, the contrary promise is included. So it's just the principle of opposites. The opposite of what God requires is what? Forbidden. The opposite of what God promises is? Threatened. That was the way God threatened is promised. Now that lays the foundation. This principle in particular lays the foundation for all the reformational catechisms. Because what you, what you have is what we have here. What does the commandment require? What does the commandment forbid? Now eight of the commandments are in the negative. But that the principle is they are requiring uh, much of us. Take the first commandment. It's not simply forbidding idolatry. It's requiring us to have God as our God. Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy um, 11, 12. Uh, we're to have him, to fear him, to swear by him. So that's a very important principle. Dr. Piper? Yes. Does anybody not believe that about the law? Any Christians in history ever <laughs> believe it's even possible? It seems like I mean, we have to have the contrary included. But is there any theological perspective that somehow denies that there is an opposite? 
I can't just imagine it. But I don't know. It's a good question. The papists wouldn't. So they get trying to drive trucks through all of them. But uh, Mr. Dotson, do you know? No, sir, I'm not entirely sure. Are you unentirely sure? Partially sure. Partially sure. Partially sure? How about who, do we have any, uh, how about Lutherans? What the, in Luther's catechism? I don't remember it. They take the same format, don't they? In Augsburg? No, no Luther's, Luther's catechism. Luther's. Use the Catholic order. Well, I, I'm going to get to that. I know that, but that's not what we're talking I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. Um, I don't know of, of any. Now, I mean, moderns don't even think this way. So, um, I'm sure that if you went down the street here and asked somebody, um, what does the first commandment require? They might have a blank look on their face. Well, it forbids. Yeah. Uh, the fifth commandment, a uh, fifth principle that what God forbids is at no time to be done. What he commands is always our duty, and yet every particular duty is not to be done at all times. So the first place, that whatever God forbids is not to be done. Now I have heard Professor Frame and his ethics and others uh, say that uh, there can be a hierarchical uh, commandments. There ain't no such thing as a hierarchical commandment. Whatever God forbids, there's no occasion whatsoever that that is to be done. But what does it mean by that not every duty is be done by every person at all times. Let me illustrate this. Uh, back in the 80s, there was a movement called Operation Rescue. And th these were people that were invading abortion clinics, uh, violently taking people out. Since that, we've had the bombers and the stuff like that. It's kind of grew out of that. And they'll say, well, Proverbs says, to rescue the innocent. Uh, but Proverbs are written to a king, or a son of the king. And uh, so that if I were a magistrate, I would have a responsibility to whatever I could do legally to shut down an abortion clinic. But as a private citizen, because I'm not to violate private property, then I don't have the right to go in and destroy somebody's property because they're not uh, fulfilling the duty of the law. But now switch it. Right now, abortion laws only permit abortion. What would the Christian's responsibility be if abortion laws required abortion? Well, I don't know that we would have the right yet to go in unless the woman was forcibly pushed into that situation. And then you might have the right to defend her life and the life of the baby. But Dr. Piper. That, that is very different, you understand, a principle. And right now, we're, we don't live in a situation, in China, it was, it was required. So then, as a Christian, you'd have a different role as well. So as a magistrate, you'd have, as a parent, you have a role. As a child, you have a role. As a private citizen. This goes back to the question that one of y'all asked last week about reforming the church. Zach did, I think. And I'm saying it depends on who you are. If you're an elder, then uh, you've got higher duties. If you're a private church member, your duties are not of the same breadth. Yes, sir. You already addressed what I was going to ask. So. Oh, I'm so smart. Good. <laughs> Everybody understand this fifth one? Pick it as no hierarchalism, but we're not all required of every duty. It's according to our position, vocation, calling, and life. Hey, Dr. Piper? Yes. So, I'm assuming in hierarchy of laws, we're talking about um, you need to say, for example, during the Nazi era, uh, people saving Jews, um, Corrie ten Boom, right. uh, where her sister said, no, we should tell them the truth, and she said, we should protect them. Right. Uh, is that what you mean? Yes, and we get to Christian liberty, we'll come back to that. Uh, we, we then follow Peter. That really comes out more there. We must obey God and not man. So anytime the state would tell us to do something, then uh, if, it's con if it's contrary to God's law, we, we humbly exercise civil disobedience. 
I'm not sure if this question directly pertains to this paragraph, but can we ever be faced with a situation where we're between a decision that requires sin on either side, one is a lesser sin than another, or is that an impossibility? For I think it's a, give, give me an example. And I'll... I can't think of one. I've heard people pose this to me, you know, where they, they felt they were so deep into a bad situation that there were no good options. There was just no necessity of them. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, Dr. Pine, I just, uh, what, what have we said here? That what God forbids is that no time to be done. So uh, that's telling me if this principle is true, and I believe it is, that in God's providence, I'm never between this rock in a hard place where to obey one of God's laws, I break another. And that's why I'm asking you to give me a concrete situation. Dr. Pine, Caleb's got one. I guess the situation we mentioned earlier with Corey to Boom, uh, <coughs> them coming into the house and asking, are you hiding Jews? That's different. House? That's where the state has told you to, and I'm going to get into line in a bit. Uh, so, yeah. I, I think that what I want to try to show you in a little while is, is that not all deceit is a violation of the Ninth Command, contrary to Murray and Dabney. Uh, so, sorry, Rahab, when she um, was, did not reveal, Same thing. We'll, we'll deal decided. with that when we come to the, to the law. I really deal with, well, let's deal with it right now, since it's on the table. Um, my view is that if somebody has forfeited their right to life which a Nazi criminal or uh, the spies uh, or the people in Jericho or the, the Egyptians and if you were in a position providentially to kill them to defend life they forfeited their right to truth so that deceit becomes self-defense much in the same way a military ambush uh, would be self-defense. And there's a lot harder cases than uh, Rahab and the midwives and whatever. You've got the King Zedekiah telling Jeremiah, if they ask you why I'm here, then you know, say that uh, you came and asked for my for release. Um, that, um, so if you take that then, um, if a man breaks into my house, and my gun is not right at hand, uh, and he asked me if anybody else was in the house, and my wife is upstairs hiding uh, in a closet, uh, I'm gonna say no. Because if my gun was at hand, what should I have done? Should have shot him. So since I didn't shoot him, I will protect her life in that manner. So I'm not violating the Ninth Commandment, because I believe that anybody who is uh, seeking with murderous intent has forfeited their right to truth, just as they forfeit their right to life if I could exercise self-defense. Now, as I said, Murray and Dabney would disagree with that. And Murray would say when they came in and said, there are any Jews hiding in your house, you would say yes, and you would trust God's providence then to uh, deliver them. Now, I do know one person that followed, I mean, I know the story, and I had friends that, uh, that now live in Canada that hit Jews. Um, but I heard of one family where under the kitchen table there was a little trap door. And uh, so they put the Jews through that. And so the Gestapo, any Jews house here, they're all under the table. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that was in Corey, that was in the hiding place. Was that in the hiding place as well? And so there, you know, he actually told the whole truth. But that can be dangerous. <laughs> but anyway, so there are differences of opinion. There are those that think that God will tell the truth, but no, neither side is saying that you break one law to keep another law. I think that is pernicious. You want to say something? Oh, I just think of an example uh, that I've heard some people who say you can legalize harlotry, that harlotry goes underground and uh, things will be worse, so they're trying to prevent a, a bigger problem by uh, doing something less evil. Legalizing what? Harlotry. 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 Well, 
Gotcha. No, that's no reason to legalize harlotry. Well, I wrote in a passage that says God will provide a means of escape whenever you're tempted show that he's never going to put you in a situation or you never can be in a situation in which you have to sin. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Dr. Biden? Yes, sir. Uh, this is another one of those questions where you might want to slap me, but when is it acceptable for Christians to rebel against the civil magistrate? Well, there's a, again, a diverse uh, what do we the civil magistrate will do with that, okay? Or maybe under Christian liberty we'll deal with it. Later on today, who knows? That's a good question. No, I'm not at all putting you off. I won't even slap you for that one. I wish I could. But... <laughs> so the, uh, the sixth one I call the genus species. But under one sin or duty, all of the same kind are forbidden, are commanded, together with all the causes, means, occasions, and appearances thereof, and provocations thereunto. So the genus species, the Ten Commandments are actually called in the Bible the Ten Words. What we have there is the most significant moral principle in each category. And this is why, again, the exposition of the catechisms is much more detailed. Because uh, all sets of those sins, as well as all occasions and temptations to those sins, are also forbidden. That's why it is very important to understand that what we have forbidden is adultery, not homosexuality. Because adultery is violating the marriage covenant as well as a sexual perversion. And so part of our problem of why we are to a degree, justly accused by the homosexual community, I don't mean we, we, but the church, is of homophobia is because we were silent on adultery. We've been silent on no-fault divorce. So why suddenly, you know, why now do all the liberals leave the PCUSA? They put up with everything else under the sun. I say that's homophobic uh, because we're violating the more serious moral principle. It is no way lessens homosexuality. Paul says the perversion. Uh, fornication is, uh, is heinous, uh, is a heinous moral sin, but it doesn't rise to the level of adultery. So the, under that word, that chief moral principle, all other kinds, even those that they wouldn't have had in that day, such as pornography, which would be an occasion unto, as well as a form of sexual Unchastity, and Paul puts drunkenness there because it is so often in the state of drunkenness that people lose their inhibitions and then commit other sexual moralities. Uh, should we be as strict uh, with the inferences that we draw in terms of greater and lesser here uh, in terms of things like church discipline, for instance, if it's not given explicitly in Scripture, but we argue, you know, it's... Uh, so because adult uh, pornography is not explicitly commanded in Scripture, you wouldn't excommunicate them? That, that's what I'm asking. Is do we no. So if it is an unrepentant sin, then eventually that's going to lead to excommunication. I have an example to expand on your question. I actually heard somebody argue that you should not eat fast food because of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. It's killing your body yeah, that's, to eat fast food. Yeah. So it may be an application you think, but it's no. not an excommunicable. No, that is then finding the conscience. Because that's merely a, a medical judgment. We don't never we never legislate uh, moral principles on the basis I have lived through um, Saccharin being good for you, saccharin being bad for you, saccharin being good for you. Um, I see, I know reports that nicotine in moderation actually is good for male health. Now, because the government has said that all nicotine is wrong, it's made a sin. Um, the Bible has a principle about all these things, it's called moderation. So, the person who's uh, eating fast food to the detriment of their health needs to be counseled. But even, uh, let's say, 
obesity? Uh, does the church ex exercise discipline over obesity? Well, no, I think you counsel and you encourage and you try to support, but uh, I don't think that it is, and it's nice to look out of a class of non-obese people, um, that you um, would, would go that route. Because obesity is not forbidden in the Bible. Yeah, it could be harmful to your health. But then I think men like Spurgeon, um, I think he'd probably meet the modern qualifications for obesity, and he smokes cigars too, so. Um, and he died young, in his 50s. But um, Burns lived to what, 90? Smoking how many cigars a day? I mean, it's just, these are just areas we don't want to go in terms of. Um, yeah. Some people thrive on McDonald's, I guess. You're on a road, you got to eat something. Can you repeat the, you had a short phrase for number six? The genus species. You all know what a genus is. It's the general principle of species are the things you deduce from it. Anybody want to push back on this one? I mean, I have heard the arguments that nobody should smoke in moderation because smoking is hazardous to one's health. I don't think anything that's done in moderation is hazardous to anybody's health. Uh, that's, that is the issue to keep in mind. Uh, anything that is addicting is much worse sin than being hazardous to your health. Because I'm told not to be mastered by anything but the Lord. And so if I can't do without the Coca-Cola, the coffee, the, the cigarette or whatever, there's my sin problem. Not because some doctors have said it's hazardous to my health. Well, the biblical principle would be take care of yourself and you know, generally uh, care for your body because it's a gift from the Lord. But then the Bible doesn't go into specifics as to right. what's unhealthy and what's healthy. And you know, that's up to different interpretations of what, what that looks like. It's like uh, when I had interns, I required them to do some kind of aerobic exercise. And that wasn't a sin if they didn't, but if they were going to be in the ministry and have any kind of stamina and decent health, they needed to develop exercise. That's why to this day I, I exercise. Uh, I don't think I am more righteous because I exercise. I'm just more healthy than most of you. <laughs> Joke. Okay. Take a break. <laughs> All right. Number seven. That what is forbidden or commanded to ourselves, we are bound according to our places to endeavor that it may be avoided or performed by others according to the duty of their places. Now this one will, gets into the fifth commandment as well. But um, so in our seminary uh, uh, manual. I've got a thing that uh, we don't have classes on Monday morning. We don't want people uh, at guest faculty traveling on the Lord's Day to be here to teach on Monday. Now, uh, I've not enforced that as I probably ought to. Uh, but I think that's what this commitment would require me to do. Or a very practical issue, I've had students that uh, manage, say, at Starbucks, and never had to work in the Lord's Day. What would this principle say about that? There shouldn't be any changes by you working on right. the Lord's Day. So if you can work for one of these things and get a schedule you don't work, that's one thing. If you become a manager, then you're having to put others into the position of breaking the Sabbath if it's not a, a, a work of necessity or mercy. Eight. Then in what is commanded to others, we are bound according to our places and callings to be helpful to them and to take heed of protecting with others and what is forbidden to them. So we also want to be an encouragement then to the, who, those who are superiors and, and encouraging them to abide by uh, what is commanded to them. So they're very useful principles, particularly uh, for six, uh, seven, eight as well. But uh, now, yes. I don't think I understand the difference between number seven and number eight. Could you explain that? Uh, they're opposites. So, if we are in the position of the superior, seven's addressing us. If we're in the position of the inferior, eight is addressing us. 
so that you work in a restaurant owned by Christians and they don't open on the Lord's Day. But what if they decided to? And eight would encourage you to come alongside of them and to encourage them not to do that. Now, I'm kind of rocking the hard place. Let's do Christian liberty. Then I think we'll come back and start on the, on the exposition of the law. And next week I'll be able to tie that in to worship Sabbath vows, all the things that are dealt with. And rather than look at these things twice, I'm going to try to incorporate them and maybe speed up the process just a bit. So we'll skip over now to page. This will also get into some of the other questions that we dealt with, or that came up that we didn't deal with. So, this is Christian liberty. Now, we have a definition in chapter 20, paragraph 1, of Christian liberty. The liberty which Christ hath purchased for believers under the gospel consists, and it gives these things, but we immediately see that liberty is something that Christ has purchased for us. So it's a part of the effect of his mediatorial work. And this involves in us a change in relationship to God through justification and adoption and a change in nature in regeneration and sanctification. So this is the not in the confession, but this is how Christ has purchased this for us. New relationship, new nature. Now it consists then in, and we have here um, a number of, of things uh, that are negative in the first place. So their freedom from the guilt of sin. So, I mean, oftentimes we talk about Christian we're thinking only about things we could do that others don't get to do, but it's, it's so much more profound. At the very basis of it is the freedom from the guilt of sin, the condemnation, the condemning wrath of God, the curse of the moral law. So here's justification, you see. That Christ has purchased for us uh, freedom. The guilt, condemning wrath, and curse. Next, in their being delivered from this present evil world, bondage to Satan and dominion of sin from evil afflictions. Sting of death, the victory of the grave and everlasting damnation. So here now is the, uh, the deliverance uh, from um, this present evil world. And we know we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and Satan. And... Uh, the world doesn't have dominion over us if we're in Christ. The bondage of Satan. Satan does not have dominion over us if we are in Christ. And sin does not have dominion over us if we are in Christ. We've been delivered from the dominion of sin. Paul says in Romans 6, Therefore reckon yourself dead to sin and slaves to righteousness. And then we've been delivered from the evil of affliction. Now, do Christians still suffer affliction, Eli? And how are we delivered from the evil of affliction? Uh, we're delivered judicially from it. Say again? Judicially from it. Judicially? Anything else? So it's not a judgment, it's a chastening. What you mean, right? Is that it? The psalmist says that we will be delivered from all evil. Yeah. Is it like uh, when when James tells us to count all joys and trials that we go through? Okay. So redemptive in a sense. That we're still going to have afflictions, but there is no harm to us in them. And
And so we can count it a joy because all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. So there's no evil in our afflictions, only good. Now that means it don't hurt, but no harm in those afflictions. The sting of death and the victory of grace. We're going to die. But death for us is but a passage into something far greater, even for the soul when the body remains in the grave. And so we are going to <coughs> deliver from death the victory of the grave and, of course, from everlasting damnation from hell. So I don't know if you ever thought about your Christian liberty in this way, but these are the glorious things of freedom and deliverance all purchased by Christ and belongs to us because we are in Him. Then the next aspect of it is it's a free relationship with God. So in their free access to God and their yielding obedience unto Him, not out of slavish fear, but a childlike love and willing mind. So here's some of the positive things then that we have in this through a free access to God so that we come to Him as Abba Father and we come boldly and freely. And we have an ability to obey God uh, as sons and daughters, uh, not like a slave, not always a fear that He's going to zap us, but no, out of love and fear uh, because we have minds and wills that want to serve God and are able to serve God. That also is a Christian liberty that you are free to obey with joy and liberty. And then paragraph one shows us the advantages of the new covenant over the old covenant. All which were common also to believers under the law. They had all this to some degree, but in shadows and types, remember, but under the New Testament, the liberty of Christians is further enlarged and their freedom from the yoke of the ceremonial law to which the Jewish church was subjected. Um, just read those commandments and think what it would be like to be a housewife, particularly if you are an OCD housewife like my wife. Uh, I mean, it's just it's a bondage. And they have that. A greater boldness of access to the throne of grace. We have a greater sense of the sonship that is ours. And fuller communications of the free spirit of God. So that now it's the spirit of Christ and he indwells each one of us. He's not just working in us. He indwells each of us, brings us into union with the triune God. So these are advantages that belong to us over and above that which our uh, older brother sisters had. So that's Christian liberty. Now paragraph two, and you'll see the title of Christian liberty and liberty of conscience. And we're really now talking about two, two things. So the first chapter is Christian liberty. Second our paragraph, the second paragraph is the liberty of conscience. It begins by reminding us that God alone is Lord of the conscience. Now what is meant in the Bible and here by conscience? <coughs> the God giving uh, law that is not on earth. Okay, the fact that the law of God's on our heart, the conscience is something that's created by God that uh, is a moral arbiter and it makes judgments for God for us or against us thus con science so uh, the conscience first is that which uh, has a standard and then it bears witness to your behavior and then it makes a judgment that you're guilty or not and so the standard is the law of God in our hearts for all men. 
for the believer, it's the law of God on our hearts now, informed by the law of God. It's revealed. So the conscience then, knowing the law of God, knows the standard, will make judgments about our behavior, our thoughts, words, and actions, and will either excuse or accuse, which is the final judgment. Now, God alone is Lord of the conscience, which means He alone regulates the conscience as to what is sin and what is required. And we answer alone to Him. Now, we must always obey conscience. And that's why Paul says that which is not of faith is sin. So this is where the whole thing in, in Romans and Corinthians comes down about causing your brother to stumble. It doesn't have a thing about being an example to him that he's offended because you're doing something he doesn't know what you should be doing. No, the whole thing is, it's in the context of meat offered to idols. And in your conscience, you're free uh, to eat that meat, even to go into the idol temple and eat at the idol restaurant. Whereas a Christian brother or sister would not be free either to eat the meat or to go into the restaurant. And you urge and compel them to do so when they act against conscience. That is very dangerous for them, but also for you. Anybody that you get to act against conscience. Now the conscience is wrong, and thus it needs to be instructed, but never coerced, never encouraged to act against conscience. So that's basically what Paul means that what, that's not what a faith is sin. If you do not think it's consistent with God's commandments, your conscience isn't free, then you must not do it until you instruct your conscience by Scripture. So the Puritans had what they call cases of conscience, and that's where they would take moral issues and then would pose a question and seek to answer that question from Scripture. The purpose of those exercises was to train conscience and to get people to think biblically about uh, every area of life. So when we say here that God alone is Lord of the conscience, he's the only one who can compel us to do something through conscience because it's his witness to us. And what we're told then is he's left it free and I want you to notice the distinction here. From the doctrine of the commandments of men, which are anything contrary to his word, are beside it in matters of faith and practice. So what would be an example of the first, left it free from the doctrine of the commandments of men? So if uh, a Christian tells me that if you watch uh, college football on a Saturday, you're sinning. Now, he has set himself over my conscience because he's called it sin. And he has given me a direction that is, uh, uh, as, it, as it says here in the language, that is um, contrary to God's word. It's just nothing in God's word that um, just alerts me at that point. Or maybe, that, uh, maybe a better illustration would be um, told me not to fast. But God's word tells me to fast. That God's probably the better example. The things that God's word tells me to do, the side of the church tells me I cannot do those things. Uh, then they're commanding me contrary to God's word. But notice with matters of faith or worship um, beside the word. So, what I'm to believe concerning God, man, all doctrine, all ethics, uh, no, nobody may give me a commandment in addition to, alongside that, our worship. So we're talking about the regular principle. Uh, conscience is one of the issues now involved. Because if a church is telling me I've got to do certain things in worship, that I believe are in addition to the Word of God, they have done played, they've been playing my conscience. Because I am required in corporate worship to 
to worship corporately. And so I will have to sin uh, by not worshiping corporately uh, in order not to violate my conscience. So they put me in a very difficult situation. So they put me in that situation. Do I violate conscience or do I violate, well it's a principle of corporateness, so I'm not going to say it's a sin, but it is a biblical principle. So this is why that we only do and worship that which is revealing God, <laughs> which we'll come to next week. Uh, conscience is one of the issues. So when the church makes lists of things that you may do that's contrary to Scripture. So let's say the use of alcohol, where Scripture actually commends alcohol for the tithe festival as well as for the Lord's Supper. And the church tells me it's a sin and I can't be a member of this church if I use alcohol. You see how they have violated my conscience. Now, Churches do have the right to legislate things that are for the common good. And this is what we see, for example, in uh, Acts 15, the letter of, of the apostles. There were some things that the apostles, they didn't tell it would be sin if the Gentiles ate some things, ate blood or, or uh, meat that had been strangled. But they asked them not to do it. And uh, the same way that your elders may say we're going to meet at... Uh, 9.30 and at 5 on the Lord's Day. Or we're going to have catechism. Or we're not going to have Sunday school. These are things you might even feel strongly about. Um, but that, that's their prerogative as rulers in the church. As long as these things are not contrary <coughs> or beside. Contrary to the commandments of God. Or beside it in matters of faith and uh, worship. So you see the principle of God being Lord of the conscience. So... It's not that uh, the church cannot require certain things of you if you're going to be a member there. Um, the church can require that they want ushers and they'll take out the offering to wear a coat and tie. Um, that is not violated by his conscience. It's merely a matter of things being done decently in order and we want you to do it, do it this way. So you understand what may, may be legislated not no moral or doctrinal principle. As we say, the Christ has had the church alone legislates. These are rules for the effective governing of the worship or practice of the church. All right, so God alone is Lord of the conscience, effective free from the doctrine commandments of men and anything contrary or beside in matters of faith and worship. So that to believe such doctrines or to obey such commands out of conscience is to betray true liberty of conscience. So you might um, voluntarily obey the church if they tell you we don't want you to use alcohol, um, as long as it doesn't become a matter of sin, and you voluntarily say, all right, I want to be here, it's, it's worth submitting to that. But the more they made it a matter of sin, you see how they violated this. Then I don't think you could submit. See the difference? I had an experience when I was pastoring in Mississippi, and uh, the uh, old RPCS that now has joined with the PCA, doing a church plant in Atlanta, and they were recruiting me to uh, go be a church planner, and it really had a lot of, Atlanta then and Atlanta now are very different, okay? Atlanta would not have any appeal to me now, but uh, then, had a church in a city, a thriving southern city, and that had a lot of appeal. So uh, the guy, the regional home mission guy, picks me up at the airport in Atlanta. And we're driving up into the mountains in Boone or someplace up here in North Carolina. So he starts asking me questions. He found out that I used alcohol and smoked a pipe in moderation. So, oh, we're going to have a big problem. The guy that's in charge of the home missions happened to have a pastor here in Greenville. Um, it was very much a fundamentalist. And there was no way that he was going to approve me to be a church planner. So, first thing happened was, without telling me, they gave me a theology exam, which they said was one of the best they'd ever had. So now they're in this situation, well, here's a guy that really, you know. So then when this came out, oh no, we won't have him. So, 
I did not want this on my conscience that I uh, hindered something that might be of the Lord. So I said to him in this committee, I am willing to abide in freedom by the requirements of your committee in Presbytery. And when a church forms in Atlanta, I'll then abide by whatever the elders want. I said, I didn't bind my conscience. I didn't say that you're right, and this is a moral principle. But I was willing, uh, for the sake of peace and trying to go the extra mile, to uh, acquiesce. It didn't work. But anyway, um, that's the kind of thing I think we should do when they're not... Uh, Biblical principles that would be violating if, if we can lead people back home. Dr. Pavi, this is a question when it comes to issues of dress. Um, does, um, how do you t determine what's discreet and indiscreet? And I'll give you an example. When Jim and I first moved to Greenville, we got friendly with a, a family which had a they had their first two children and then a long break and then the third one came unexpectedly and the third one was the same age as our boy, Matt, our son Matthew. So this little girl and Matthew used to play <coughs> together. But they had um, the older two children. Their son was 15 at the time. And he was in a Christian youth group where some of the families didn't see any problem with their daughters wearing scanty costumes bathing costumes. So during the summer when... Is that swimsuit? Swimsuit, yes. Okay. Sorry, used the wrong It's word. all right. So during the summer, this youth group would arrange swimming parties and these girls would be in their uh, scanty swimming way. And my friend and her husband did not want their son to go because he never, as my friend said to me, he never sees his older sister in that state of undress. So we do not want him to see other girls from other families in that state. And um, so that raises the question, where does, so they didn't allow their son to go, which was a <coughs> family issue because he wanted to go with his friends and um, he felt they weren't fair to impose that on him. But where does the issue of discreet and indiscreet? Well, first place, the, the parents surely had that right. Uh, and I think rightly exercised that right. That really gets back to principle seven and eight. Um, Paul gives pretty clear directives in First Timothy two with respect to uh, modesty and dress, and we're not to tempt each other. So uh, I uh, there's been times where I have encouraged uh, if, it's, if there's a husband that's ahead then you know, go to him and say you know the way your wife is dressing the way your daughter is dressing is not uh, conducive to holiness for the men in the church we really wish that uh, that do this um, if it's a woman a single woman then I send a woman to church to, to talk to her I think that we don't take nearly enough consideration about these things, both in how people dress in church and then, of course, these social activities. Um, you would think that people would love the neighbor enough that if somebody said this really is an offense and a temptation, that um, they would not want to, to do that. Um, so the church has every right to say in a church-sponsored uh, activity, uh, we only want one-piece swimsuits. Mm -hmm. In fact, for the longest time when I was on the board of uh, RYM, Reformed Youth Ministries, R RYF, no, RYM, the high school, um, we had that requirement that uh, if girls came uh, to the brought a swimsuit, it had to be a one-piece swimsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's not binding somebody's conscience, that's the church being wise, and should be. So again, if the elders knew that there were some people in the church that would be offended 
they should always, I think, and it's not something excessive, uh, something like this where it does become a matter, yeah, you can say this is subjective, and that's the problem with it, but uh, you don't want to cause your brother or your sister to sin. And so the church is not binding their conscience, not saying it's a sin for your daughter to wear a two-piece swimsuit, but you do not want that going on church activities. Now, in Brazil, uh, the church is much more careless about what women wear. Is that fair? Sometimes. Okay. Um, and to the Dutch churches. Are there any Dutch people in here? I find the Dutch churches in Canada sometimes that what the young ladies wear to church. Is, uh, and it's happened to me at Second Press sometimes. These sun, just in spring and sundresses come out and the whole back is exposed. I just don't care to be worshiping or looking at some woman's naked back. So anyway, those are good questions. And I think that we can wisely draw lines that don't Lord over people's consciences, but do have the right to establish principles and guidelines. So in the same way, the seminary, um, you have blue jeans on. Yeah. <laughs> the seminary uh, requires uh, slacks uh, and a button, uh, a collar shirt. Uh, that's not a matter of conscience. It's not a matter of saying you're saying that you don't. It's just a matter of saying we pay the bills and this is the dress code that. Hopefully it has some self-respect. Is that useful? The distinctions? Jack? So, like, in, in the specific example of female dress and not wanting to foster uh, <coughs> sinful thoughts on the part of men, at what point do we push back on the other side and say, well, that's also on you, too, to, to think those thoughts? Well, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes, I look upon a woman. I think what Job was saying there is, if I looked once and there was a temptation involved, I shouldn't look again. But, where does the responsibility lie ultimately in, in the Christian fellowship? It lies on the woman, not on, on the man, not to look a second time. No, we're not to look a second time. And since we're all perfect, we won't. Uh, so... Um, when I see women come out in public wearing, I mean, I don't understand fathers. You let your daughter go out in public. I mean, she might be dressed for bed. What are you thinking, man? I'm like, just pull my, what are you doing? You're an idiot. Um, and why? I mean, then you have to get into what's going, is it just about wanting to be in style and the woman's naive? She's naive, she needs to be instructed uh, that um, there are things going on. If she's not naive, that means she wants men to look at her as an object and not a person. And then you've got some spiritual problems. Lucas? I was keep wondering about this uh, paragraph two and the divines, their purpose for addressing this issue. Religious liberty in mind. They had religious liberty in mind. They had worship in mind uh, and doctrine. Uh, of religious liberty within the, the Christian faith. Hmm? Religious liberty within the Christian faith. Uh, right. In yeah. Yeah. So uh, they, they wanted a regulator. They wanted a confessional doctrine <laughs> that was scriptural and Protestant. They wanted a worship related by scripture. And... Uh, the Anglican Church had imposed all kinds of rituals and some doctrines or practices that would be beside Scripture and some contrary to Scripture. So would this be in a, addressing like the use of the Book of Common Order? Or? The Common Prayer was not, the Presbyterians were not greatly bothered by that. The independents were. Uh, but more in terms of things like wearing the liturgical uh, symbolic garments, uh, kneeling uh, before the communion table, church architecture that said they had to face east, a lot of these things came over from, from Romanism that had not been weeded out of the church were being required. I see. Thank you. Uh, 
what's the implicit faith mean here? Okay, we're going to get there. That's another thing being addressed. Thank you. Uh, good questions. Uh, we just have to be loving, pastoral, gentle in these things. So to believe such doctrines or to obey such commands out of conscience is to betray true liberty of conscience and the requiring of an implicit faith and an absolute and blind obedience is to destroy liberty of conscience. So implicit faith is taught by the Roman church. And implicit faith uh, says that uh, you don't need to understand it. You believe it because we say it. We teach it. Implicit faith is the parent telling the child, you do it because I said so. Now, a parent has that uh, uh, authority at certain times. The, the child, the reasons uh, they wouldn't understand, or it could be, for example, you can't you can't play with you can't go to Johnny's house and play. Why? Because I said so. Well, you don't want to tell the child. Well, there's immoral behavior down there, or we think there ought to be drugs down there, or we don't like the way they talk, or dress. I said so. But when the church does that, that's a violation of conscience, you see. Believe it because we say so. The church never has that right. That's what the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they call for implicit faith. It's actually a, a, a doctrinal feature of Romanism. Believe it because the church teaches it. Even when you don't know what the church teaches, to say you will believe it. Or vows of obedience so that Monks would take a vow of obedience, not knowing what in the world they'd be required to do, but uh, they take that vow. So that's implicit faith. And so as a church, again, we don't we we don't want mindless robots. We don't want people's consciences submitting to the church because we said so. Even in areas of adiaphora, we want to have good reasons. And so when the confession back in chapter one talks about the principles involved in ordering the circumstances of worship says they must be wise and consistent with the principles of the word. And so we don't just say the elders said it, so you need to do it. We can say that somebody's being stubborn about it, but we have to review the explanations of why we, we think we should do differently. Okay? Shepherding, would that fit what you're describing here? It's kind of like heavy petting? No. <laughs> no. Uh, yes. Although, I, what some of these people mean by heavy shepherding, I would think is just good shepherding. All right. But, no, that's what they mean. Uh, then, uh, where the, uh, the elders of the church have involved themselves in the lives of the people uh, to a degree that goes beyond. Um, proper pastoral oversight. So let's say you don't like the NIV. You'd be wise. But the elders then have no right to tell the people in the congregation you may not use the NIV. If we come in your home and find the NIV, we're going to deal with it. We get recommendations. We think that these versions are better. But now, if the, if the elders oversee a bookshop, I'm talking about a real situation, and they say you may not carry the NIV, and it's under the elders' authority, and the man carries the NIV, then he should be disciplined. Mm -hmm. That's different because they had rules for how the shop was going to be. Bookshop inside the church, yeah. not somebody else. No, it was, it was the church's bookshop, which is, in a sense, maybe problematic. But. <laughs> or a book table, that wouldn't be problematic. So the church has a book table. No, we don't want the IVs on there. And the person stocks the NIV, then that would be a clear violation of a... <clears throat> but heavy shepherding, I think, in the negative sense, would be yeah, the uh, uh, elders domineering um, with a lot of unbiblical rules. But it's been applied to people as simply doing regular pastoral family visitation and trying to hold people accountable. That's why I say you have to be careful. Good. Good questions. Pastoral. Paragraph three uh, gets into then um, the relation uh, or the purpose of liberty, which is very important because, again, 
Some people won't let their freak flags fly. They who upon pretense of Christian liberty do practice any sin or cherish any lust do thereby destroy the end of Christian liberty, which is that being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, we might serve the Lord without fear, and this goes back to paragraph one, in the holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And so it's not a matter, oh, I'm free now, I can do any of these things that in moderation. We had a, one student live with us in California. I was very offended that uh, I would use alcohol in moderation. Uh, he was a Bob Jones graduate, had become reformed, and ended up living with us, which was very interesting. He was a good friend now. Uh, anyway, so he moves off. He's up north. I think he was in the Grand Rapids area, and he calls me. Like, Dr. P, you know what I'm doing right now? No, it's fine, I don't. Drinking a glass of scotch. You know what I said to him? That's good, but you make sure you stay moderate now as you have changed your position. It's not a freedom to license. And so then that's what's going to lead to here when they come out of fundamentalism. That they you know we're still to live chaste and moderate lives. And that's what this is getting at. It's never licensed to sin or to abuse um, our practices. And then to get to some of the questions that we've dealt with, paragraph four deals with the relationship of liberty to church and state power, constituted authority. And because the powers which God hath ordained and the liberty which Christ hath purchased are not intended by God to destroy, but mutually to uphold and preserve one another. So we have two pillars. We got God appointed authority, which all told would be family, state, and church, but here particularly it's state and church, and we've got Christian liberty. God has never intended one to destroy the other, but for them to work together in harmony, mutually to uphold and preserve one another. They who, upon pretense of Christian liberty, shall oppose any lawful power or the lawful exercise of it, whether it be civil or ecclesiastical, resist the ordinance of God. So this is based on Romans 13, for example. And the king was probably Nero when Paul is telling the Christians that any lawful commandments, yeah, he's, he's got this role, this God-given role, but if he's not fulfilling it, that doesn't mean that you are free to disobey him. You, uh, you obey his lawful commands. Uh, and you do not use Christian liberty as to say, well, I'm not going to obey him because he is not a Christian. So the lawful power or the lawful exercise of it, whether it be civil or ecclesiastical. So this is the lawful exercise of his authority. So... Um, being a, a rebel at heart, although I've meddled a lot in my years, uh, laws like you must wear a seatbelt. Uh, does the state have the authority to make that law? Lucas doesn't think so. He lived out west too long. Biblically or constitutionally? No, okay, I'm not talking about constitution. I'm just saying, theoretically, does the state have the right to tell you to use seatbelts? I would argue, no, no they don't. But at the same time, we should obey because of the authority that they represent, the office that they represent. Okay, maybe I should phrase the question. It's not a sin. Is the state to wear a violating scripture to tell you to wear a seatbelt? So, should you wear a seatbelt, the state tells you. It's really what I'm trying to say. Lucas doesn't want to, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> too much like me when I was his age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're not binding your conscience. It is a, a civil law that actually, probably out of nine tenths of the laws they make, actually is proven to be quite beneficial. Um, so, there's one. Um, Trouble says, I never get a dead person out of a seatbelt. That can be pretty 
sobered. Um, and I've seen plenty of people thrown myself and killed. So, um, and then you're endangering others because you could be thrown, hit the driver, you could be thrown and hit another car or whatever. So, all right, it's not a matter of conscience. So if the state has legitimately passed that law, should you wear a seatbelt, Lucas? Yes. Okay. I do now. <laughs> How about a motorcycle helmet? <laughs> I didn't use it. You will tomorrow. Mm -hmm. South Carolina doesn't have a motorcycle helmet law. Yeah, they don't. No, that's why we've got a lot of dummies running around. Yes, that's what I noticed. When you say you ended with uh, if the law was lawfully <coughs> passed, what if you're in a situation Perfect. with a government who doesn't lawfully pass law, you know, a tyranny or something like that, but the law that they're enforcing, like a seatbelt law, isn't necessarily morally binding or, or... Yeah, if it's within the authority of the dictator to do it, that's lawful. So how is that determined? We're going to talk about rebellion in just a minute. But I, I, first I want to give the principle that these non-morally binding laws that the state passes, um, we ought to submit to them. Now, I'm very happy because the uh, South Carolina State Highway Patrol actually published in the newspaper that on the interstate, they allow you to go to five to seven miles over the posted limit. And so I take advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> I drive by and wave at them, and they wave back. But they posted that. This might go under the rebellion thing in just a second, but would you say that uh, the divines and such were justified in executing Charles? Well, he, he invaded his own country, A, B. A, B, he was caught with communication with the French to invade his own country after he was in prison. So although most Presbyterians were opposed to, because they were loyal to the Stuarts to a degree, I think that they had the right to execute the king because he was breaking the law. Dr. Piper. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, just, just curious, I didn't have a chance to ask you a minute ago. Um, you said most Presbyterians were not opposed to the prayer book. I'm, I'm just wondering, where can I read about that? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you later. They actually used a couple of prayer books. Um, the directory of worship, which is good, was actually a compromise between the Presbyterians and the uh, uh, independents. I mean, look, Knox had a prayer book. The Scots were right. not opposed to a prayer book. Uh, neither were the English Presbyterians. And so one starts with a W. Um, the, I don't remember the name of it right now. But many of them used it. Um, and they didn't have any particular scruples with, even Owen would have no scruples against common prayer, only against mandatory. There's a big difference. So a prayer book that allowed liberty then would... Uh, uh, they would have been fine with that. It was the prayer book that did not allow the liberty of free prayer that they would have been opposed to. Uh, the mandatory common prayers with no free prayer. Or the liturgies of facing the front or calling an altar or whatever. But in terms of a, a liturgy, and I deal with this, I actually have a paper on this, and I gave it at a conference here. Uh, and it might be in that book on worship that Nick Wilborn and I edited. Uh, I did with the worship course as well, that there is a prescribed liturgy that they were not uncomfortable with. It was the required rubrics where you had to only say the words in the prayer book. There's a big difference, you see. So they would have been happy with two or three, the uh, directory or uh, a, a written out liturgy as long as it wasn't required. For some, somehow, in the Scottish tradition and your tradition, the independence usurped the book of the Directory of Worship and Knox's book of, of worship. And I don't know how that happened historically. 
both the catechism and the directory of worship say, for example, that we should use the Lord's Prayer in worship. But see, in your tradition, that is uh, verboten, when in fact the catechism says we should. I always thought it was the form, like not the form as in we recite it, but that we see it as a form. And so when I offer a pastoral prayer, for example, then I would pray with the form of the, of the Lord's Prayer, not the exact uh, words. And some of our guys do do that, by the way. I just myself could not bring myself to do it. And, uh, well, you know how that goes. No, how does that go? Well, Dr. Piper, we just, we just worship very basic here at Colton Ham, and I, I like it that way. That's good. <clears throat> what God would prefer. I don't, I don't feel like we should go down this road. <laughs> playing with you while I'm looking up something. Okay? How is the Lord's Prayer to be used? The Lord's Prayer is not only for direction as a pattern according to which we are to make other prayers, but may also be used as a prayer so that it be done with understanding, faith, reverence, and other graces necessary to the right performance of the duty of prayer. So, yes, the first thing is there, what you're doing, but it actually says, and then in the directory of worship, it actually encourages the use of, of the Lord's Prayer uh, in, our, in our worship. But it doesn't call for recitation of it, right? <laughs> Y'all want to tell me what words mean? <laughs> as long as it's done with reverence and understanding, yes, that's exactly what it says. It may also be used as a prayer. But, right, but may also, I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm not trying to sound dense or trying to get you, but may also be used as a prayer. I, I just always interpreted that as you can pray this if you so choose to do Yes, this. that's right. But that doesn't give you license to recite it as a congregation. <laughs> Read again. For your church body praying. This is all, the Lord's Prayer is in the plural. They talk about that. The preface is we're praying with and for uh, one another. So, no, the, the Reformed Presbyterian understanding was it should be prayed if that was what one wanted to do. And that actually the Director of Worship says to use it as such in corporate worship. If you got the old copy of the, of the standards, just look that up in the Director of Worship. Anyway, no, I, I'm just kind of picking on you. You don't mind, do you? No, no, Dr. Papa, I knew you were picking on me. Uh, I was just going to say, if you wanted to debate this, I'm not willing, but I am willing for early dismissal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to provoke you, sir, until I have you in my worship course. <laughs> I'm just joking. No. No, these are, are useful kind of... Uh, I wish we'd discussed a lot more what we do in worship. But I still say that the Scottish traditions got carried over in the Free Church continuing and in the RPCNA is really a violation of uh, the Westminster Directory of Worship and of Reformed Worship. I, I do think that. Same with the use of creed, which again, the independents kept cutting out. So finally, the Scottish Parliament said that uh, we think it's fine to use it. We just couldn't get it, and it's consistent with the Shorter Catechism. Uh, so, but now the really fun discussion will be, not seatbelts, but as was asked a while ago, what about rebellion against the government? And there were actually different opinions uh, in uh, the Reformation. Uh, Calvin was of the opinion to the Institutes that the lesser magistrate may lead 
a rebellion against a tyrannical higher magistrate. So that would be, say, the colonial assemblies voting to take that colony out from under the tyranny of King George. Or, as much as people don't like it, when uh, southern states in the state legislature voted to secede from the Union, that wasn't even rebellion. That was the constitutional right they had, and uh, nobody had the right to coerce them not to. Um, but that was, again, done lawfully according to um, the Constitution, both the federal Constitution and the uh, state constitutions. Now, Knox took the position of, so what you find in the Covenanters is that uh, they, in a sense, they were lesser magistrates because there was nobility involved. But when the prayer book was imposed, they took up arms against uh, the English. Um, and the Huguenots also were of this mindset that if the tyrannical government persecuted them, then they had every right to take up arms. So those have been the two uh, kind of lines of thought. And so Rutherford and Lex Rex will argue that if the king is not governed by the law of God, then he has forfeited his right to be king. Of course, he's writing that in a Christian context. I can't see Paul writing that in the days of Nero. But they did live in a different con a, a context. So, uh, what do y'all think? I'm just curious if there's a, because you gave the two options of rebellion of kind of a lower authority against the higher authority, and then rebellion of anyone. Was, that, was there, in Reformed history, a thought line of no rebellion? Quakers? Ursinus? I'm joking. Who? Uh, or Silas in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, interestingly enough, makes the point that the government can take away your right to have armaments and you are to be as submissive to them as possible. And it's like a big thing in certain Dutch churches is that we have to be like very, very submissive to the, to the government. So uh, basically you take Ursinus versus Rutherford. Rutherford is going to have a much more robust idea. But Ur Ursinus doesn't say no rebellion. He just says you acquiesce to as much as you can. But Dutch, Ursinus says you can't have the tools of rebellion if the government takes them away. And Rutherford says no, you can have arms. Good old <laughs> Thank you. That's that's useful. In the in the French Confession, it makes it pretty clear too that uh, you're to be as good of a citizen as you can. But when the government comes to you and threatens your home, your property, your life, then you have the duty to rebel against them. That's why they took over La Rochelle and started an armed rebellion. Right. But when they were crushed, they had to leave. Uh, and uh, Deshaun Du made that pretty clear in all of his writings as well that you. Be as good of a citizen as you can. The Huguenots were very good citizens. But uh, when push came to shove and Francis came knocking on their door during uh, against the Edict of Fontainebleau or uh, on St. Bartholomew's Day, then it's time to take up arms and fight the government. But that was only in dire consequences. When the government takes your guns, then you really have no defense. Somebody was just telling me about just talking to that uh, it was a country that uh, required people to turn in their weapons because they were being so careless with them they had a very high murder rate and uh, I still thought that was not wise uh, Dr. Pepe, I had a question about that second option I mean, it's not really an issue with the first option but the person sponsoring the rebellion so to speak is the lesser magistrate but in the second option of the individuals is it being done as individuals or is there an aspect in which the, the corporate church is involved in that? Well, I mean they did organize uh, and they put together militia and yeah but if they came to your door in the middle of the night so if a Nazi came to your door in the middle of the night um, and you could defend yourself and then go join the resistance because you sure couldn't stay home afterwards. <laughs> Dr. Piper, can you provide a, a scriptural principle or scriptural examples for uh, this rebellion against the government? Yeah, because so far I've heard a lot about who said this, who said that, but uh, 
would like to hear more about what scripture says on this issue. Um, I think it would come under the matter of a corporate self-defense if there's a tyrannical government uh, that's persecuting the church that um, the inference is if we can uh, defend one another we should. So it's more inference. From which uh, specific? Uh, the sixth edit. commandment. Fabio? Uh, do you believe that both uh, options to rebel are biblical? I prefer Calvin's option. That I do think I can defend biblically more easily the civil magistrate leading it because he's got that God given authority. Second question is um, what is the line that you tell us that? we can rebel or not, like, it's just when our lives are threatened, or, uh, for example, because you can have a tyrannical government that is not threatening your life directly, <coughs> but he raise up taxes a lot and goes beyond the Bible limits. No, I think that the Bible speaks to that. I think the Bible says that you pay the taxes. Um, you know, the uh, in our own country, the Constitution... Uh, does trump everything else, supposedly. And one of the reasons for the amendment about uh, uh, bearing arms was the realization that a government with unfettered power was dangerous. And thus, the citizenry should bear arms if they had to form a militia uh, to uh, uh, protect themselves against tyranny, they could do so. But that, again, is under government leadership. So as I said, I would have no difficulty, and if y'all want to vote for me, that's fine. I'll become the governor and, of South Carolina, and uh, I'll, I'll close all the abortion clinics. Uh, I can't that, vote for you. Rebellion. <laughs> I know. Rebellion is not really a matter of weapons, you see. Mm -hmm. Rebellion is a matter of laws, and I, I prefer to apply the principle. So in a city. So if Greenville City Council uh, passed a law that could be no abortion clinics within the city limits, uh, I think they'd have the right to do that biblically, um, probably constitutionally. But I don't know about that part. That gets into the uh, Calhoun's, uh, what was that called? Nullification. <coughs> hmm? Yeah, nullification. I'm off nullification. But anyway. But Dr. Uh, Palmer, what did you do in a situation like China where they had the one-child policy? So they, the, the state legislates on that. Yeah. And then if you have... I, am, I know of... Um, actually, a, I don't know which state the gentleman was from, but he went out to China to teach in um, the university to teach English. And one of his students um, was a young girl who became converted and they eventually got married, but she was the second or third child in her family, and the state made several attempts during the time that her mother was pregnant with her to have her aborted, and in God's providence, every time the mother was forced, compelled to go to the abortion clinic, something happened that either the doctor didn't arrive that yeah. day, or the machinery... No, that, that's down. very difficult. Uh, part of the get over to the, the just war... Uh, theory and you don't ever take up arms without the hope of winning. Mm -hmm. An armed rebellion in China would be crushed so quickly that um, it would make no sense. But those kind of things, and it, it actually depends on the province, I think, and, and Joan can help us here, but some provinces where you pay a tax or something, they don't really pick on you too much. Other provinces would uh, try to enforce it. They've changed that because they've recognized that you cannot have an economy. Mm -hmm. Even though they got a couple billion people, uh, they don't have enough workmen. Japan's the same thing. Not enough workforce coming up with a, a one-child rule. Even a two-child rule does not replenish the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so they're having to, to slack off. But you're right, and I mentioned that a while ago, if, if they commanded a Christian to uh, commit an abortion, I think at that point we would have to be willing to die for our principles and not commit the abortion. But we can't. That's different 
type of rebellion than leading an armed rebellion against them. Anything to add to that? Yeah, All right, we'll get this chapter wrapped up here. Uh, for the publishing of such opinions, or maintaining of such practices as are contrary to the light of nature, or to the known principles of the Christianity, whether concerning faith, worship, or conversation, or to the power of godliness, or such erroneous opinions or practices as either in their own nature or in the manner of publishing or maintaining them, are destructive to the external peace and order which Christ hath established in the church, uh, they may lawfully be called to account and proceeded against by the censures of the church and by the power of the civil magistrate. So, uh, a number of months ago, there was a man in a PCA congregation in Houston, Texas, on the Democratic ticket for governor? Uh, Senator. 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 Who said that although personally I'm in favor of abortion, that I celebrate Roe versus Wade and would never do anything. A number of churches wrote his church and he was forced to, uh, to back down. Uh, of course, he said, well, I, you know, people didn't understand what I said. All the typical political spin. But he did back down and withdrew, and withdrew from the race. Uh, and so uh, that's what the church should have done. I had a couple of my church in Houston that were great letter writers. They write anybody. And wrote the pastor of Bill Clinton's Baptist Church in Arkansas and said, why aren't you disciplining this man? <laughs> and the church should have. Or the Pamby Namby Roman Catholics that don't deal with their people that are voting for same-sex marriage or abortion. Um, they should be. You know, these people should be called to account. Um, and so, again, if we have somebody in one of our churches that begins to publish public opinions uh, so it's picking these areas, abortion, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, uh, these types of things, then I believe that uh, the church should act. And I think this helps you understand then that the confession of faith would be opposed to some of the tenets of the libertarians. Because it's not government leave me alone, let me do what I want to do. No. If you teach, publish, practice things that are contrary to Scripture, are the peace of the church, then you may be called to account. Now, I've been playing with an argument as you wrap this up, that this last paragraph uh, is against good faith subscription. Good faith subscription is in the PCA that, we talked about that before, that you can uh, take exceptions of various weight to the standards, but the standards themselves say you can't. <laughs> if you have an opinion that's contrary to the received truth, then you may not publish it. So our whole denomination, I think, falls under the condemnation of this paragraph. So here's what I'm going to try to do next week, folks. I'm going to, I want you to, I've asked you to read the larger catechism on the law, right? So, and then read the chapters on worship, Sabbath, and vows, which is a bit beyond, I think next week was just Sabbath and vows, worship and Sabbath, I mean, or was it vows and vows? and maybe even marriage. So any of the chapters that deal with one of the commandments, I'll try to weave those things together. So obviously, uh, uh, worship, Sabbath, vows, marriage uh, would be things that we'd try to deal with as we talk our way through the, uh, through the exposition of law. It's a new approach for me, so we'll see what happens. Might give up halfway through. All right, folks, go home and stay up and cheer for the good guys. Thank you for watching this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu.